was a lady in here, but she's gone now. It's typical when you're in the JVM space and such. Anyway, our next speaker. This is fun because it's the VM Summit, another JVM Summit. Mm -hmm. All we see of Google usually is um, uh, Jeremy Manson uh, when it comes to JVM LS in the summer and talking about the, uh, uh, the Google JDK. Uh, but now we actually have uh, Bekislau uh, Egoro from uh, uh, the VA team and now the Dart team who works for uh, Google Orvis is going to talk about patterns of VM design and the uh, problems. The pain, of course, it's been a lot of keynotes of pain today that you bump into when you implement uh, a, a, a runtime for, for dynamic languages. And perhaps you'll throw in some Dart, I don't know. Yes. Uh, excellent. So uh, whenever you're ready, go yes. for it. Yes, okay. So I think I'm ready. Oh, we're live on film. Yeah. Okay. We're live on film? That's pretty Sit bad. I okay. No, I mean, yeah. Thank you. You are making it much easier. So, um, hello. Uh, I'm not nervous at all because I'm being uh, live translated and I'm not very politically correct, so I might say something very bad about GVM maybe or something else. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, my name, as you already know, is completely unpronounceable. Uh, but if you're my friend, you can call me Slava. And uh, I hope I will not make any enemies with this presentation, which is not about Java. So, uh, when I made the first slide, when I started making slides, I uh, realized that there might be a false impression that uh, what I will tell you will allow you to create a beautiful handwritten VM. So I remade the slide. My uh, talk is more about not so beautiful handmade VM, but they work relatively well. So uh, don't hope that you can reuse what I tell you uh, for anything useful. So. Uh, uh, yeah, if you ever need any psychological help about the JavaScript semantics or anything like that, you can send me a mail and I will cry together with you. Uh, now, uh, I uh, am basing this talk on my experience working on the V8, which is a JavaScript engine, and on the Dart VM, which is a Dart VM. Uh, the Dart, who does not know, it's like Java on the outside, small talk on the inside, uh, kind of. Uh, but before I started working on these two VMs, which are both VMs for dynamically typed languages, uh, I worked at a company called Excelsior doing the head of time compiler for Java. Uh, I managed to escape before uh, Lambda forms and all the method handle fun came in because uh, compiling that ahead of time is uh, very pleasant. Uh, I suspect. So yes, I will be basing this talk only on V8 and Dart VM experience. Uh, this is JavaScript. So uh, the biggest problem with JavaScript is that it's so cool and uh, you can uh, write the code uh, which can do many different things uh, with the same function and you don't know what's, what things are standing for. Like what is this X? Where does it come from? What is that Y? Where does it come from, and what is this mass, and so on and so forth. And uh, somehow you want to efficiently execute this. And uh, for a long time, people did not figure it out how to execute this efficiently. And then at some point, uh, somebody fell from somewhere, hit the head, and invented the flux capacitor, which allowed to run the V8 much faster by sending it back into the past and so on, not V8, JavaScript. Okay. Uh, so uh, when uh, I speak about virtual machines, I usually say that all the design decisions you have to make, they can be uh, split into three different groups. Uh, it's, uh, you need to decide how you're going to represent things. You need to decide how you're going to resolve things, like what does the name mean? And then you need to figure out how to redu reduce redundancy that your resolution step produces, like if you resolve the same name several times, how can you avoid doing that? And uh, I usually just start going, uh, describing what V8 did for all these uh, three steps, and uh, at the end, the beautiful picture emerges. But because we are on this hardcore VM Summit event, I'm not going to hide things behind the beautiful picture. I will show you uh, the real meat of the system instead. Yes, well, no, well, it's a little bit hard to go all Remy because uh, I don't have this anonymous class uh, thing with a patched class. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, the, somewhere at the end. So don't spoil my uh, story. Okay, so, uh, yes. Uh, so the talk is called uh, Patterns of EM Design, but when I was started making slides, I figured out there is actually only one pattern uh, that emerges, is that uh, every dynamic, uh, the, the ev every VM for a dynamically typed language is all about splitting your execution into two parts. This is like ultimate decomposition rule. You have a fast, uh, part of your program, and you have a slow part of your program. And uh, it's not a decomposition in a strict mathematical sense where the fast pass does its, its thing and the slow pass does its separate thing. It's more like a fast pass is a subset of what slow pass can do. And uh, basically, if you want to run the dynamic language fast, you need to find a way to split the semantics, the organization of your VM into these two parts. And uh, that's basically it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, that's a secret I just d divulged to you. Uh, let's talk about this, how this decomposition applies to accessing the property. As I told you, there is no way to know where this, prep where this property is uh, in JavaScript. So uh, yeah, that's the problem we are trying to solve. We want to guess where the property is. If we manage to successfully guess, well, we can do it fast, right? If we guess. If we don't guess, well, we will call to a slow pass that can handle everything. Uh, it turns out guessing doesn't really work, right? Because <laughs> what, what do you expect when you don't guess correctly and so on? Uh, better than guessing is to remember where the property was the previous time when you saw this access site. And this is a technique which was known since small talk ages, long time ago. I was not even born, or maybe I was, but I don't remember. Uh, and it's called inline caching. And that's basically, when V8 was just released and it was fast, it was all thanks to the inline caching. There was no other technique that V8 employed at all. There was no complicated optimizing compiler like in the GVM. There was only inline caching. And it already allowed JavaScript VM to run much faster than the simple interpreters, which constantly perform these lookups and so on. Just remembering where the property was the previous time which you, when you accessed it. So uh, the inline caching on the high level looks like this, right? You have a property access site, and then you have cache, uh, which just maps shapes to the uh, places where the properties are. And here, the people who are not sleeping after lunch can say, wait a second, you were just telling us that the JavaScript is so uh, nice that everything, uh, there is no shapes in the objects whatsoever. And your slide here talks about shapes suddenly from nowhere. Uh, how does it work? Well, it does not, right? It does not apply directly to JavaScript without some other trick. So JavaScript objects, they look like this, a fluffy clouds of properties. And uh, you need something else to actually discover the structure behind the JavaScript object. Uh, I usually, when I talk about how the structure is discovered, I show the example with a point. So uh, who knows JavaScript? So that, that we know uh, that, OK, so kind of can, can read this uh, abomination of a language. Uh, uh, so this is a constructor, and I use it to create points with uh, two coordinates. So what V8 does when you come here and execute the uh, first line is it creates an object, and it attaches to it this thing here, uh, which is a, a shape of an object. And initially, the shape is empty, right? It's just, it was constructed with a point constructor, but there are no properties there. When you execute the assignment, it's an assignment. It's all imperative. The assignment creates the property. What happens is that bloom, uh, uh, there is no sound connected to my, I have to do sound effects myself. Uh, uh, it creates another shape. So shapes are immutable. That's one thing to uh, see here. Uh, it's not like a hash table where when you put the key, the hash table changes. No, the shape is completely immutable. So it creates a new one, uh, and now it's still a point created with constructor point, but now it has a property, x, 
and we put the property here. Uh, simple, and you can guess what happens with the execution of a next statement. Bloom happens, right? So, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, why do I keep those uh, instead of like, just discarding them, letting the garbage collector to come and collect them? Well, that's because when we come again, we don't have to create anything from scratch. We just follow these transitions from one shape to another, and uh, we arrive to the same place. And now you can see two objects constructed in the same way. They are pointing to the same shape. So the only thing you need, so you have now a fast way to determine if two objects share the same shape. You can just say, okay, uh, do they have the, do, do they point to the same thing? Yes, they do. They have the same shape. If they don't, it does not say that they have different shape. But, uh, so it, it can only give you positive answer. Uh, of course, if you add another property to the second object, they will no longer share any shape. There will be another shape and so on. But if you add property Z to the first one, it will go and share the shape again. So, and this is the second part of the uh, hidden V8 source, though it's actually also from Smalltalk. Uh, so self-VM had this maps thing, which is the same as the hidden classes. So, uh, Different VMs call them differently, like JavaScript core calls them shapes or structures. Structures, Spider Monkey calls them shapes and so on. Everybody has them. Nobody talks about them. Yes, you can ask me a question if you want to. Do you dare? No. It's too late. It's too, it's too late, right? You want two objects constructed in the same way to arrive to the same shape. If you, have, uh, if you do it late, in the, there is no creation process, right? What this captures is a, it's a creation process captured. Well, it's a different shape, right? It is true, yeah, but uh, I think it, uh, it will not always work. What if two objects flow first into different call sites and uh, then there will be two different shapes? Yeah, but so you also want these objects to be compact. This also allows you to, be, to have compact objects like here. I know, when, when, because I do it when I create in objects, I can profile how many fields inside the objects I need and so on. So doing it during creation is much, gives you more benefits than doing it for the call side. Yes, you can pollute, yes. If you are not careful and you pass objects created in a different way into the same call site, right? So it seems this is more useful if you, like, if you write your code in a way that is uh, reflecting like you would write it in a statically typed language, where you cannot create different shaped objects with the same constructor, then it runs fast. Uh, maybe creating them at call sites can work sometimes, but I need to think a little bit about more and when camera is not recording me because I am so stressed about this. Uh, uh, I need some volume. Uh, okay, uh, where I was, I was somewhere. Uh, Yes, I told you about this. Yeah, I told you about this. We are trying to approximate the static structure dynamically. Uh, but it turns out there are more uses to it than just uh, putting properties in the right place. For example, here there is an array, and I put into array the square roots of uh, integers. And uh, V8, when it was uh, designed, it's uh, like, you know, in the dynamic languages, you box things. And uh, you can also choose a tagging scheme which allows you to avoid boxing some things uh, by putting them directly into the slots. Uh, and V8 said 32-bit platforms are more widespread, 
there were no 64 everywhere like now. Uh, let's just uh, put integers into slots and the rest, like doubles, we will box. So there are different tagging scheme which allows you to put doubles into slots, like NAND tagging. Uh, but it makes all your objects twice as large. So which you know, on 32-bit platform is not desirable. Uh, and uh, so you can see that in this code you will have an array of doubles, essentially because not all integers uh, are squares of something. Uh, I, I leave the proof for you in your free time. Uh, and uh, you will end up with an array full of boxes, which is not a fast thing to operate on. We know that pointers are bad. We all listened to the opening talk. So I will illustrate what happens. Uh, loop goes away because loops are too hard to reason about. Uh, let's just execute them one by one with no sound effects this time. So you start with an array, right? You store zero. Zero is a nice square of zero, good. One is a nice square of uh, one. Oh, yeah. And uh, here where it breaks, we have this double box floating around. And you would prefer to not have the box floating around. So what V8 does, it says, oh, but why uh, have an array to store anything? Let's uh, have an array first to store integers. And then when we try to store double in there, we will create uh, uh, a shape or a hidden class that says this is now an array of double. Of course, these are not doubles. They're not fat enough to contain double. So we will enlarge this, convert them all to doubles, and store the double value directly. So now we have a more efficient representation uh, of the array full of doubles. And we captured this as it was constructed with no static typing whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, so you can see this is the, this is where the R points to. So this is the thing. So, and uh, this is the elements array. So there is an indirection still, but now there is one less indirection for accessing the double value itself. Uh, uh, so where I was? Okay, I was there. So if you store something that is not a, a double, like this floating thing here, uh, of course you have to abort, abort, cannot handle this. So you rebox this all. Actually, this should not be boxed. This is a bug in my slides because this can be just stored directly in the fields. Uh, and uh, then you store it by pointer. So, uh, so V8 can track not only uh, like what kind of elements are there, but it can also track if there are holes. So the JavaScript arrays, they have this nice feature. You can have a hole in the array. And when you read from that hole, you get to the prototype of the array and you load from there. So uh, you have to constantly check, did I actually read something meaningful or did I read the whole? Then I have to traverse the prototype chain. Uh, so the, the tracking lattice looks something like this. So it's, uh, uh, it looks relatively simple. Uh, uh, yeah, so you start with integers, doubles, and anything, uh, or you can have the holes with, with the same types. Okay. Uh, the same can be applied to fields as well, right? If you have the floating point value stored in the fields, you don't want to uh, store, a, like, it doesn't allow you to avoid uh, the indirection on 32-bit platform, but it allows you to avoid uh, creating a new box when you store value. Uh, so what you say? Jiggly juggly. So, uh, the types will be encoded in the shape, and when you mutate this, you mutate the boxes instead of uh, allocating new boxes you and storing them. Uh, of course, yes, on the 32-bit platform. On the 64-bit platform, you can store directly in the... Uh, uh, it's hard to pre-allocate enough space uh, to put it directly on the 32-bit platform. Uh, the problem with this approach, if you can notice, is that uh, if you read, uh, you better be able to read unboxed value as well and operate on it, because otherwise you allocate the boxes. If, if, you, if you're in the context where you cannot uh, just do operations on the unboxed values, you will constantly allocate new boxes. So, uh, 
So this is the mutable boxes. Dart VM also does the same. So Dart VM made the same choice that uh, we uh, only support integers in the slots by tagging them and uh, doubles all these boxes. Uh, so and uh, here is uh, one small detail here that you need to be able to read unbox and operate with unbox values. And I didn't yet even tell you how this works. So you need some other machinery to actually do it. Uh, because like interpreter cannot operate with unboxed values, right? Uh, and so on. Uh, I will return back to this. So, and finally, V8 also applies uh, this technique to functions in a special way to be able to arrive to something similar to the V table in some sense. Uh, so we don't want the hidden class of the uh, prototype of the objects produced by constructor K uh, to say, okay, there is a field F which contains something, and there is a field G that contains something, I don't know what. Because every time you would call them, you would have to check, is it a function? Where does it go? So uh, you don't want the picture like this, right? So uh, there is this uh, hexagonal sh things, they show functions, and this says, there is, fun uh, there is something at f and there is something at g. Uh, so what we do instead, we want to arrive to a class-like structure. In class-like structure, the methods are pinned to the class itself, right? So what we do is we promote these closures upwards to the hidden class. So the picture was like this, and now it's like that. So the hidden class contains the value for these fields. They're not stored in the object. So now, just by checking the hidden class of an object, you can determine that it, I it has given methods. And then you can call these things without checking what where you call it. Helps in lining and so on. It has drawbacks, esp in this, especially in this implementation, uh, because uh, the whole function is promoted upwards, not the literal in the sense that, not the behavior, the function with the context. And uh, people sometimes create things, uh, they store the same function literal, but different instances of the function literal into the fields, and we abort this optimization. We don't create even we say it uh, doesn't work this way. So, uh, but it can be implemented that the behavior of the function is promoted instead of the function, and I think that's how it should be implemented. Yes, it's, it's, it's as it's constructed. So it tries to follow the transitions. All the classes are connected with transitions. And if it fails, it aborts and uh, it goes backwards. So yeah, when I do a presentation for JavaScript people, I usually say, this is amazing technology. It works always. No drawbacks. Uh, but here I do tell you the truth. It has issues. Uh, well, GVM people can easily recognize one issue. If there is a meta space, there is a meta problem here. Uh, you want to collect these classes that you create as your program runs. Uh, if you collect them too eagerly, uh, you have also to discard the code that depends on this and so on. Uh, but because they can appear again, you will recreate them again, you will have to recompile, reoptimize the code, so on. So you don't want to discard them eagerly. If you discard them lazily or too lazily, then you leak memory and crash eventually without the memory. So for some time, V8 uh, embedded the, all the pointers to the hidden classes into optimized code as a strong references. That does not work so well in the programs that do a lot of metaprogramming. Uh, so now it embeds it weakly, but it leads to a problem that sometimes it discards the code that will be later used. So it's kind of unsolved problem. And it's still a heuristic. So, uh, if you look at this code, like uh, what I try to illustrate is exactly the problem where you have different functions in the same, sa the, the field that named the same way. And uh, here when the V8 arrives to the fourth line, it will say, oh, I cannot follow the transition and I have to do something. And in different versions, it does different things. So in the most recent V8, both loops will run slow because it can't in line and it will do the call again and again. Uh, in, if you go a little bit back, the first one will run fast because it will still have the good hidden class where it knows the function that you are calling, and the second will run slow. And if you go even further behind, then both of them will run fast. So it changes over time, so people uh, have to have real good understanding of what's happening, otherwise they cannot write uh, high-performance code. N 
it's only if they're connected through the through something. Here they're connected through the object constructor, right? So yes, they, they will clash in this function. Uh, but if, if, if I started, if I created a constructor for them, which is not an object constructor, and I add it with the same name, there will be no clash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, names of properties that contain them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, uh, and no, don't, 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 yeah, add the unique prefix to your function name. Yes, thank you. Uh, or just create constructors. Don't use object literals. Anyway, uh, it almost never affects the real world performance because people create constructors and write codes. It is more complicated. Uh, yeah. Now back to the loading property. We were all talking about the preparation for loading property, basically. I'm reminding you what I was talking about. Oh god, I spent already almost all my time. Uh, yeah, so we were talking about inline caching, and we uh, have inline cache in the object property access. So the inline cache in V8 looks like a pig nose. Uh, for those of you who are Americans, they know that th this is how it looks in America, the pig nose. Well, it's actually a power socket. Uh, so the inline cache in V8 is the thing where you can plug different things in uh, with the fast pass logic inside the thing that you plug. And this is basically a call site, which is patchable. Uh, so and the thing goes to the power station, to the runtime, uh, when the fast pass cannot handle it. So this is how the compiled code basically looks like for an inline cache in V8. You move object in one register, the name into another register, and then you call some routine in the runtime. And the routine in the runtime is not implemented in JavaScript. I just, C++, I would be going like here. Uh, what it does is it does lookup, and then the lookup result is not the value, it's the path. And the path can be compiled to a small piece of uh, machine code and patched into the uh, to the load side. The call instruction is just patched, and uh, you return the value, and it all works. So here is what happens, right? So we generated this small thing which checks the hidden class, and uh, if the hidden class does that much, it goes to the miss, and otherwise it just loads from a fixed offset. Done. This is how hidden, cla uh, hidden class and inline caching work in V8 together. So checked, miss, otherwise load. There is a fallacy here is that if, the, if you only have the IC cache, uh, inline caching, you try to speed up everything by doing inline caches. So at some point, V8 ended up with uh, tons of different inline caches of, and the inline cache stops, all of them written by hand in assembly for at least three or four platforms. A lot of exciting code with the bugs different on different platforms. Uh, so. These days, it's not like this. I will tell you briefly how it is, but uh, this was painful. Uh, so that, that was how it looked like, right? The, there is a plug for every occasion making the something faster. You would have a separate handwritten stuff for like array pop operation if you determine that this call site does array pop, right? So good. For the Dart, we knew already it is painful. And we knew code patching is not the most secure practice if you want to run in the environment where you want to make your co generated code non-writable. So we said no code patching for us. And we do a simple inline cache stop, only one of them, uh, not written in JavaScript, but still. So you just get the, uh, you, uh, you have some table uh, asking, like you can ask it to give you a, a target for a function call based on the class of an object and uh, if there is no target you go handle miss uh, which produces this target and then you just call here people who can read javascript or this pseudo code that i wrote uh, they can say oh wait a second what about field access right dart has some fields and you showed us one inline cache tab for function calls well uh, in dart we realized that uh, there is there are only function calls so uh, Accessing the field X is just calling a getter on the field X. And uh, accessing the, like setting this field is just calling a setter. And uh, it actually matches the Dart semantics very well because 
Dart allows you to override the field with a getter and override the getter with a field. So uh, it doesn't allow, well, n these days there are mirrors that allow you to build the methods on the runtime, so you can actually do that. Uh, but um, the base language it was, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a uh, it's static structure. But it's still all dynamically dispatched, so it doesn't help you much. Uh, so uniform is good. Uh, yeah, so I was talking in line about inline caching, and I still have 10 minutes at least, or 15? 10? 10? 15, okay, good. So I'm almost there. I like to make a lot of slides and uh, lose myself in them. Um, you can realize that there are a lot of inline caches in this uh, function that I showed you originally. And they all work independently. They do not talk to each other. Uh, they speed up every individual operation to the peak performance in V8, uh, but they don't interact. So in my previous decomposition where, where I was talking about this paradigm of splitting the operations into fast path and slow path, it looks like this. What you want to do is reassociate this expression uh, like the compilers do. You want to put all the fast things together and the slow goes also together, kind of. And uh, I just derived the optimizing compiler for you using this <laughs> paradigm. So uh, uh, I have an empty slide for some reason. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, I know. So disregard this picture. So it should be this picture, but without that thing there. So something with the link. Oh, I have no internet access. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, what I was going to say here, but this joke does not work, is that if you have one compiler and you can't solve your problem, then you can solve your problem by adding another compiler. And then the, this thing appears here. But uh, yeah, and that compiler is more complicated. It has different intermediate representations. It has some thing inside and so on. And uh, again, attentive people can ask, but what's the difference? Why this compiler could not do the same and have this spaghetti ramen here? So, and the answer is, it needs something to speculate upon. And the way we did it in V8 is we take these inline caches and then we parse generated code to determine what is the state of these ICs. Because uh, when I was telling you about how the inline caches work, I told you that it just generates a piece of code and it patches it into a call site. I did not tell you that it stores information upon which it generates the code. And it does not. So what we do, we take these things that are patched in there and we parse it and we get the feedback for the compiler there and it can do the ramen thing and then produce a nice optimized code. So this was the crankshaft. Of course, uh, these days it's getting reworked slowly but surely to the proper way to do it, no parsing. Because if you misparse something, you get strange feedback. It still works, but you get strange feedback. Uh, so yeah, as I said, there is a problem here in this dotted line that it pattern match the generated code. And having two compilers which start with a different representation. So this is just a simple AST based one pass and that one is a high level intermediate representation based. Uh, so you need to keep them in sync, especially the, the optimization points. If you don't do that, you fly away very fast uh, because it optimizes to a wrong place. Uh, yeah, and when you have the VM only with interpreter, it's even better. So anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's that's uh, the high-level overview of the thing. It's basically no innovation here. It's also all well-known technology. Uh, the key thing is speculating based on the IC uh, data that they collect, and uh, of course you need the technology to check. Uh, whether your speculations are correct, so on. You go de-optimize, it's all so well known. Uh, you can also depend differently. So not the code that, it's not the code that checks the things, but somebody else checks that the assumptions are not violated. So instead of the use side, you basically check it at the definition, essentially, of the value. So if you, you can depend that some prototype never changes, and you don't check it every time when you access the prototype. Instead, you do it in the place that can change the prototype. So there are two different ways of optimizing the code. Uh, yes? So 
I told you that there is this good way of looking at the performance of a dynamic language, but actually it also has a lot of traps, just like the system with the hidden classes. Uh, there is this uh, desire to speed up the code by doing a quick hack, right? By writing something in assembly. And then it works fast on your benchmark and solves the immediate problem. But this is a maintenance issue, right? If you don't uh, put your money where your optimizing compiler is, you, you produce the code base that is not maintainable. So uh, manual decomposition of the program or runtime or virtual machine into the fast and slow path is a maintenance issue. And here I'm entering the final uh, phase of my talk where I uh, say that I have no clue how to solve it, but I want it to be solved. Uh, so what I want to, the problem that I want to solve eventually is that given the description of a runtime in some language, a Russian for example, can I send it to Amazon Turk to derive the fast pass semi-automatically? I don't know. Can I have a compiler that does it for me? Uh, so the idea that we try to uh, operate on is that if you have the optimizing compiler, you should use it as much as possible. So at least you should start by, instead of handwriting the machine language, you should start writing intermediate representation or maybe even the input language for your VM. So in the V8, I was telling you about the handwritten stops. These days, the stops are written in the IR of the optimizing compiler. Uh, and uh, the Dart VM is the same. Uh, we write intrinsics using the IR. We recently ported. So V8 has the reg expansion, which is pretty fast. Uh, almost, I think it's one of the fastest uh, reg expansions available there. And uh, it has five or six different machine hand-coded backends for different hardware, basically. Uh, when we ported it to Dart VM, we made it emit the v optimizing compiler IR instead of the machine code, so we don't have to port it again. Uh, so there is another problem, is that runtime, it speaks like Swedish, I can only speak Danish, or it backwards, it speaks the wrong language, not the language that I wanted to speak, it speaks the C++ of course, these days we have C-Lang and so on and so forth, but it does not help you. You don't want to uh, make it, in, like, integrate these things together, even if you could, even if you can get the GC points inside your C++ code. You don't want to do it. You want to write the language that your optimizing compiler speaks, not somebody else optimizing compiler. Uh, and there is a problem that user code, it also needs to be able to benefit from the things you do to your optimizing compiler. So the example I have here, this is a real Dart code. So uh, it's a part of a Dart to JS compiler. And it has this type information uh, hash map. And our API for the hash map allows you to call this put if epsilon thing, you give it a key, and then if the key is not present in the hash map, you call a closure that will produce the value. So in some things it's like, Thunk, a lazy evaluated thunk that will produce a value. You don't want to produce a value if the key is already cached in the map. Uh, for this code to run efficiently, uh, in the case when you almost always hit the cache, you need to eliminate allocation of this closure. You don't need this closure to be allocated every time you call this thing. And it turns out the only way to get it reliably is to put annotations on this. So you never want to enlighten this thing but you always want to align the if epsilon thing and then let the allocation sink in. So we have allocation syncing, which can take care of the closure as long as you inline. If you inline this one, you might run off inlining budgets before you, you inline this one. So you never want to inline this one, but you always want to inline these things. Uh, so you want to give the users the way to annotate their libraries, because otherwise they cannot write the performance code. It doesn't have to be this low level, but there need to be some way. Okay, some users don't know anything. I don't care about users that don't know anything. So I, I ask you this, the following question. How many users that don't know anything write a high performance hash maps? No. Yeah, they can try, but they don't write them, right? Uh, do or die trying. Anyway, so. Good 
for them, good for them. Uh, anyway, I have a, I'd have trust in humanity. I am, in, I am a Russian, I'm optimist. So, uh, anyway. The last, almost last slide. So, another problem is that we have a lot of libraries in Dart, they implement it in Dart, just like in Java. I'm not telling you something you, you never heard about. Uh, we have the typed arrays, which are similar to typed arrays you have in JavaScript. And uh, if you have a method like for each on the, which is defined once, and then you use it for different lists, it goes polymorphic. You already heard this story several times, I think, uh, in, the, in, in, in this room today. And uh, what you want is to give the ability to say, this is the, needs to be specialized for the receiver, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the, uh, I think we need this annotation, so a different ways. There is no way a uh, compiler can have enough time to derive it himself or herself or itself. Uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, we will leave it for the questions uh, part. So e how about this easy part, right? I don't want to warm up my VM with a blowtorch before it can run anything. So what I want is to be able to pre-cook the stuff that I, uh, like the library routines, I want to pre-optimize these things. This idea can go even further. You can pre-cook the things you compile. So if your language is not like, if your optimizing compiler does not do the too complicated spaghetti, you can pre-create the small patterns of assembly code with some inputs and outputs and just glue them all together and get relatively good performance very fast uh, if these patterns are small enough and so on. Uh, and you don't want to write the backend for every architecture that's available. You want to use some other compiler that's like LLVM to pre-create these patterns for you. Uh, so preferably at the build time, not at the user machine when he wants to load one function and show blinking thing on the page. Uh, so. Yeah, this is how I view the universal VM. I put universals in the quotes because I'm not that optimistic about universal things, uh, but mildly optimistic. So yeah, it needs to have the very simple core language. Uh, it needs optimization hints in some form, be it Russian language or anything else. Uh, it needs to support this fast, slow decomposition. So all the things that I talked to you about today are all about decomposing fast and slow, like the opts, re -opts, so on. And uh, it also needs to have a build time step to pre-cook as much optimizations as possible, at least for the libraries and the parts of the runtime, uh, pre-generate the IC stuff and so on. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. Do we have any questions? Are there any questions? Except Remy, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Well, but Remy, okay. So, so basically, what you want is to write your uh, JIT compiler in JavaScript. Uh, no, preferably and not in JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> or or, in, or in in Dart. Yeah, Sorry, in Dart. No. Uh, and another way, uh, but uh, instead of putting uh, annotation, what you want is the runtime to be able to save an image, like in small talk. Yeah, exactly. And the annotation will be in the image. Yeah. yeah. And in that case, your user don't put annotation. It's your image runtime. No, it's, it's uh, yeah. But image will contain more than just uh, what it contains in small talk, right? It will contain optimized code, which is, which it can be also produced by offline compiler, right? I can create IR for LLVM during the build step and pre-compile these things to native code. Uh, something that my compiler might not be able to do, right? I, I might have only a simple compiler embedded in my VM, but a complicated compiler taking care of many other things. From it. So, yeah, it's philosophy, not programming. Yeah. Um, I've got a question in, in a second, but um, the, the saving stuff to images and saving your, your choices between runs seems like a very attractive idea. We were going to do it in, uh, we were thinking of doing it in our implementation, and then we discovered that several of our users um, with big installations re-image all the PCs overnight, getting rid of all your caches and everything, no, no, so no, all your end users are screwed. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm not saying about saving optimizations, kind of. Uh, the, the, the Java VM that I worked on, it had the JIT cache where you could cook the JIT cache into the uh, DLL and reload it. The verification of the JIT cache is a little bit expensive, I would tell you. Uh, but that's not what I want. I want not to save the optimization decisions that you get on the user machine, but optimization decisions that the VM implementers do, essentially. You want to have optimizations for the VM itself, not for the... Um, the question I was going to ask was, uh, you, you talked about uh, um, the shapes of objects and uh, these shapes uh, mutate with the properties that are added and can change with the types that have been put into those properties we have to change storage structure. Yeah. Um, do you have a problem with real-world code or an explosion of shapes, or do you have some heuristics to say, actually, this thing is starting to get a bit... We're getting too many shapes from here, we'll just go with a, with a strategy that's not optimal, but reduces the number of shapes. Yeah, there, is, uh, there, there are some limitations on how many shapes you create, and there are also, if you put too many properties into an object, you will say it's a dictionary you will bail out to use a dictionary representation for an object. More questions? Concurrency? The languages I work on, they think yeah, threads, exactly. concurrency... They uh, so that's, that's a dodge. Uh, that being able to patch up these objects when you know no one else is going to yeah, be touching them. Yeah. It's... Uh, we learned the threads the thing of the past, right? So, uh, <laughs> what can I say here? Yeah, that's definitely a dodge. So yeah. <laughs> a professional one, though. If there are no more questions. This time it's true. <laughs> so, if there are no more questions, we'll take a 15-minute uh, break until... Uh, and uh, then... Uh,